Shapeshifting, one of the hallmark abilities of the druids of Dungeons and Dragons, and the same can be said for the Circle of the Moon druid in Baldur's Gate 3. Focusing on the wild shape form, you have a character that is strong without really any gear throughout the entirety of the game. In this video today, we'll be going over how to build out your moon druid. Maybe you're playing with Halson, Jahira, or making your own character as one. Whatever the case, we'll break it down for you. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge in my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. With that being said, this is a very straightforward build. You have really two options. You can go 11 levels into moon druid, with one level into either wizard for unfettered access to all spells or sorcerer for constitution saving throw proficiency as well as early mage armor. The other option is taking nine levels into moon druid and three levels into wild heart barbarian to gain the full resistance to every damage type. The trade-off is that you have less spells you can cast and your wild shape has less health but does more damage and takes less damage from all sources. The choice is yours really and we'll discuss both later in the video. But that's the entire gist of this video and if that's all you wanted to know please feel free to shut down the video and get back to enjoying your ultimate shapeshifter in BG3. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, subscribe, 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 comment with all that action. Each one of those helps me out in a huge way. I currently have something like 89% unsubscribed viewership on the channel, and that's a metric I'm trying to change, so every little bit helps. You can jump ahead to any part of the video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. If you need help with any other subject in Baldur's Gate 3, check out my playlist linked below and at the end of the video. But let's get started here on the ultimate moon druid build for Baldur's Gate 3. Starting us off, we're going to go into a conversation about race, as always, and really what we're looking for here are things that transfer to our wild shape when we go into wild shape. And for the most part, it's pretty much going to be any passive ability that a race offers us. So that's what I'm really going to go through here. Any one of the ones I talk about are just fine. Even if you want to choose the ones that are not the ones I talk about, it's going to be just fine. It's a single player narrative game. Go with the choice you want, not what I or the internet says is good. So Wood Elf, either uh, half or full, gives us fleet of foot. That five foot movement goes towards... Uh, our wild shape form. So that is quite good. We like that quite a bit. Also, halflings, their luck thing here, rolling for, you get that lucky roll, that happens in wild shape form. Same thing here with brave for advantage on saving throws against being frightened. That's a really great uh, little ditty you can get access to. One of my favorite ones, though, with um, uh, this whole such situation is actually gnome, and I am not a huge fan of small races. Gnomes get their uh, race feature here of gnome cunning so advantage on intelligence wisdom and charisma saving throws so anything that would otherwise maybe make you have or make you lose control of your character you get an advantage on that saving throw and the forest gnome um, gives us dark vision which is cool but you get to speak with animals it's just kind of a nice little thing to have and it's very thematic so you can have access to that um that's not important. I thought, I thought it was something else. Uh, also, too, they move 25 feet per turn, which is just kind of like your basic racial as in general. Um, as you can see, this guy, these guys move 30, so gnomes are a little bit slower. Just keep that in mind, but it's not going to matter once you go into uh, wild shape form. I just wanted to bring that up. Now, dwarf is pretty good here as well because the gold dwarf, this um, increase to health will transfer over to your wild shape form and Dwegar will get access to a um, free enlarge and you can cast enlarge before you go into wild shape form or use a potion of Colossus both things will all effectively uh, give you enlarge and that will transfer over to your wild shape form also to having the Dwegar resistance here for advantage on saving throws against illusions and against being charmed or paralyzed, as well as the dwarf advantage on saving throws against poison, as well as resistance to poison, all transfer over to your character, which is very, very cool. Um, another big one, too, is the half orc. Now, the savage attacks will not transfer over to any of the wild forms that do not use melee weapons. The myrmidons, the, the elementals you can transform into, do use weapons so savage attacks and the feet savage attacker will apply to the myrmidons that use weapons so if you want to go hard in the paint all full 11 or 12 levels into moon druid you can get a benefit here from the uh the half orc so those are some of the ones that really stand out for me i mean probably going with um i'd probably just just go with the wood elf because 
I like elves so much. And as far as our class goes, we are not going to start as a druid. We are going to start as a sorcerer because this will give us a proficiency. I don't know where it shows. There it goes. A proficiency in our constitution saving throws. What that means is anytime we go to roll for any of our constitution checks, which concentration is going to be, we get our proficiency added to the check. It starts at two, becomes three, and then eventually four at level nine. That is huge because concentration spells are spells we can cast before we go into wild shape form and we will retain those concentration spells as long as we're not enraged, of course, which will become a conversation later. So it's nice to get this on board very early in the game. You can turn it on with resilience um, or the, the feat resilient constitution if you so wish, but this is just a free way to get access to it. We're never going to use it again, but we are going to also have access to some cantrips. So these are the ones I'm going to go with. We've got Blade Ward, Friends is just nice to have, uh, Bone Chill, and Ray of Frost. And then for some spells, um, I like Magic Missile. We can swap off Shield for Magic Armor, uh, for Mage Armor, because this will work um, when we are um, in Wild Shape, if you so wish. But, and also cool too here is it adds the dexterity modifier. Our subclass is going to be Draconic Bloodline because this plus one to hit point is going to transfer over to us in Wild Shape. And mainly Dragon Ancestor White gives us Armor of Agathis, which is going to do two things. It's going to give us temp hit points and it's going to give us cold damage. It is always going to apply those things. So the nice thing is we can cast this outside. We don't even need to cast this in combat. We cast this whenever the hell we cast this. And we get the temp hit points and cold damage, which will transfer over to being in wild shape. It's a nice ability to have that adds a little reactive damage. It's a great defensive buffer, and it makes things pretty nice. Now, you can choose wizard here if you want. And wizard implies that you're going to go heavier into the casting portion of being a druid by just simply choosing any damn spell you so wish. That's not the, the overall take I'm going with this character. I'm going to focus on mainly the wild shape and druid capabilities and sorcerers augmenting those with what you see here and that uh, constitution proficiency. For your background, please go with whatever makes sense for you and the role play you create for your character. As I always say, these backgrounds are going to give you inspiration points, which you can use to re-roll things in your game. So having the kind of role play for your character in mind that makes a little bit more sense makes the game just more fun. Are you an outlander who has become, uh, started initially as a sorcerer with the innate uh, abilities of a sorcerer and then became a druid? Are you a noble who has kind of forsaken their noble birth and joined some sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, druid grove or coven? And coven? Is that, is that what you, is that what you call it? <laughs> and has uh, become a druid. Are you a soldier or whatever it is? Choose the thing that makes sense for you and your character and your playthrough. My go-to kind of uh, general pick for min-maxing is Insight and Persuasion from Guild Artisan. It's just a nice two to have skills in automatically, which then brings me into the conversation about skills. If you do go with a, a Wood Elf, you will have Perception automatically, as well as Stealth. So those are kind of nice to have. And you'll also have Persuasion if you go with Guild Artisan. Uh, I, from there, would then probably choose something like a Deception or Intimidation to just kind of add that as an additional uh, conversational option. And then maybe one of these, it doesn't really matter. You can just kind of go with whatever you want that fits the role play of your character. Now, as far as your abilities go, they don't matter because we'll be taking in a wild shape. We'll be taking on the wild shapes abilities. We can improve the wild shapes abilities through some other means like using resilient defeat and stuff like that. But for the most part, we're gonna focus mainly on wisdom because that's the only one that's gonna matter because that's our casting capability as a druid. Even though we're starting as a sorcerer, we can forsake that. But I've put my charisma here to 12 because if this is the main character, I still wanna have some capability to talk and use dialogue options. That's why that here, that's here. And constitution's at 16 just to kind of help me out with uh, overall health pool. You could swap this off to that if you want to kind of have higher decks for more AC, but that and, and really more initiative. That's the best thing here. And if you're not playing with this as the main character, you could probably take these charisma points out and put them into constitution a little bit. In fact, I think probably you could do something like that because we will be taking a resilience. So if this is the main character, I'd probably do something like this because we're going to take resilience decks, which will then give us a proficiency in decks and put our dexterity up to 16. 
So you'd have 16 dex, 16 con, and 16 wisdom, which is pretty sick for the character. So if I was doing it, probably this is the way I'd min-max it. Maybe if I wanted to get a little bit more out of the main character, I'd do something like that, just to help you out with those ability point scores. For the progression for this character, I'm going to be using Halton for this. He's a wood elf, so that kind of fits the overall take of what I would go with. So once we get to level 2, we're going to branch off from Sorcerer, and we're just going to stick with um, Druid. You can do, like I said before, nine levels into Wild, or I'm sorry, into Moon Druid, and three levels into Barbarian. Uh, you would just start with Druid in that case. Um, you could have done Source, you could have done Wizard here, whatever the case is. But in this video, I'm going to be branching off now into Druid, taking my cantrips. I like Shillelagh and Thorn Whip; they're pretty cool. Uh, you can go with stuff like Produce Flame or Guidance if you don't have another character in the party that would do Guidance. Just remember, you're not going to be using it in Wild Shape form, and you don't want to pop in and out of Wild Shape form throughout the entirety of your playthrough. You want to kind of stick roughly to one with as much concentration up as you can if you go with that. Then as far as spells go, probably get stuff like Long Shredder, since it is a ritual spell, just to kind of have that on. But you can use stuff like Fog Cloud um, or Entangle before you go into Wild Shape, and that's kind of a cool capability. So don't really sleep on those things. They can actually be pretty nice to have. Um, you can even go with like a, a Healing Word before you jump in if you need to. Um, let's just choose those, because why not? We're going to go and choose our subclass now with Circle of the Moon. So the big thing here with Circle of the Moon, of course, is that A, we get Lunar Men, so expend spell slots to regain hit points while in Wild Shape, so we can use our Wild Shape, our uh, spell slots for healing if we need to, and we get a special Wild Shape uh, for the bear. Well, special Cave Bear, I think, is another one of them. And this all kind of comes together with even more spells that we can kind of access and kind of do whatever you want with. Fairy Fire can be kind of fun to throw down if you so wish before jumping into Wild Shape. And the big thing too is you get Combat Wild Shape. So um, you can transform as a bonus action, which is really nice. And of course, these Wild Shape charges refresh on a short rest. The standard Wild Shape is an action. So this is a nice way to get a little bit of action economy here. This brings us up to level three, just more spells. Now we jump into level two. Um, you can get stuff like, uh, you know, Bark Skin. Protect your creature from attacks, increase its armor class up to 16. That will help you out jumping into Wild Form. You can get protection from poison. It's going to last when you're in Wild Form. But stuff like maybe Moonbeam is not going to be as huge. Because one of the big benefits of Moonbeam is you can use a bonus action to move the beam. So just kind of, same thing here with uh, Flaming Sphere. It's really cool on upon initial cast, but the follow-through is the uh, bonus actions you can use per turn, which you won't be using once you wild shape. But spike growth is really, really useful throughout like the early, mid, even like the early, mid, uh, early, late game. It's very, very good because on top of it, you cast this, you go into wild form and you kind of have this thing up and it's a really nice little ditty to have. So we'll have that active for me. Now the big question here is feats. Which ones work for the character and which ones do not? So let's have that conversation now. So when it comes to feats, you're quite, you're probably wondering, you know, which ones even work? And I'm going to link you guys to a really awesome Reddit post by Sancho the Seventh. He's gone ahead and put, like, since like five months ago, he's gone ahead and put all the feats, all the illithid powers, all the gear, all the racials, all the stats, everything that works in Wild Shape as tested by him or other community members. I'm going to put a link to that in the description. So you can use that as a reference guide. So I'm just going to be pretty much going right off of this. And as of patch five, Tavern Brawler is the big little pickup here. The big thing with Tavern Brawler is that this is going to enable us to do double our uh, strength modifier to the damage and attack rolls. And it only is going to count for unarmed attacks. So as long as our wild shape doesn't use a weapon, which some of the Myrmidons do, Tavern Brawler will kick in here. And you know, I totally forgot about Tavern Brawler's plus one to um, ability scores here, so we could probably have put uh, strength at nine or constitution at 15 and gotten a little bit out of this. I totally forgot about that, so I apologize, but you can go ahead and make that change if you want to. Not gonna be too crucial here. And don't worry either way. So what we're gonna do from there though is take a look at some of the other ones because you can still get the benefit of Savage Attacker on the Myrmidons, mainly the air, fire, and water elementals. Uh, Tavern Brother will work on the Earth Elemental, the Earth Myrmidons, it's worth noting. The Lucky Capability does work here, your luck points. Uh, Sentinel 
will work also on the Myrmidon shapes if they have and that can use it. Uh, mainly, of course, the class features here, the, la the latter two will also work here. Mobile will work as well. So movement speed is increased when you are in your uh, wild shape form, as well as getting the evade opportunity attacks and evade difficult terrain situation here. And uh, um, Mage Slayer works as well here, as far as the passives go. So enemies you hit have disadvantage on concentration saving throws, and you have advantage on saving throws against it. So always really good to see those. Some other ones that you would not expect to work are Athlete. Athlete will work for you, so you can jump this up to 16 if you want, and you're prone, you'll jump up, and you, basically the jump distance is your big thing. You get increased jump distance, and being knocked prone, you can get back up quicker. Quicker. Um, heavy armor, which is really weird. Heavily armored here will give you that plus one um, to your uh, uh, constitution, I'm sorry, uh, uh, to your strength while wild shaped. That is the big point there. So this will apply that to your actual uh, wild shape, which is cool. Durable, as well, will give you the constitution when you are in wild shape. And of course, you'll get the secondary bonus, bonus here. Dual wielder is interesting because dual wielder will give you the AC bonus. If you are wielding two weapons before you go into wild shape, obviously, then you'll get the AC bonus while in wild shape. Resilient, like I've said before, is the other big one we're going to focus on in this build and we're going to take resilient dexterity. But the abilities point that this increases it will apply to your wild shape as well and you'll get the proficiency in that ability's saving throw which is huge so those are a lot of the really big ones uh warcaster will work as far as the um gain advantage on saving throws to maintain concentration on spells so if you want to maintain those spells you can keep them up pretty well here with warcaster that will work but those are all the feats that do work in Wild Shape. But the one that we're going to focus on right now in this situation is Tavern Brawler for a huge increase on the damage of our character. Into level 5, it's just more spells. And really, this is just going to start to come down to how you want to play the game and how you want to make your character. Call Lightning is a really good upfront damage ability. Even though it's a concentration ability, you're not going to get advantage of the bonus portion of it, but it's still really good. Uh, plant Growth is good for slowing things down. and You can just kind of really hinder them it turn it, it says um it quarters their movement speed it turns their movement speed from 100 percent to 25 percent to kind of help you understand how that one works but pretty much go with whatever works here even daylight will work once you uh jump into act two and you need a little bit of benefit there with a lot of light into level six we get this cool subclass feature primal strike while in beast form your attacks count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks which is huge and you get Wild Shape Owl Bear, which will probably be the primary shape you'll use outside of Sabertooth Tiger until you get into your latter portions of the game. And it's worth noting, your all of your Wild Shape shapes, <laughs> your the, all the shape shifting you can do, your health is dictated by your Druid level, not by your um, actual character level. And that's important because at 8, 10, and 12, those health pools go up so for example here i think it shows me yeah so 65 is what it starts with at level 8 it becomes 78 at level 10 it becomes 94 at level 12 it becomes 112 so they will get more hit points every two levels depending upon when you actually get that shape um saber tooth tiger for example will get increased to hit points at levels 10 and at levels uh 12 but bear for example will get more hit points at 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12. So every two levels, you get more health onto your wild shapes. Also, you get wild shape panther, which is fun. <laughs> um, prepare spells, again, just kind of choose more concentration and or active spells that you're going to cast before you jump into combat. Hey, maybe you got a really hard guy ahead of you. Eat metal, make him drop their weapon, and then pop into wild shape. Whatever makes sense for you. Remember, your character is not the, this is not the only character you're playing with. You do have tons of other ones. So try to really get the benefit of that. And another big thing, too, are Conjurations. So Conjure Minor Elemental and Conjure Woodland Being are going to work because you can cast them. They last until long rest, and you can go in your wild shape before you even jump into... Well, I'm sorry. You cast them before combat, and then when you jump into combat, you can cast whatever spells you want, whatever concentrations you want, and then go in your wild shape, and you have a summon up to aid you while you're doing your thing. And the Woodland Being is actually pretty cool because they have a summon in and of themselves as well. So you can go crazy with that. Or the mud methods in the minor elemental category are really, really cool. 
Freedom of movement is really great here. Um, I've, the wall spells are really awesome. Wall of fire, they're just kind of tricky to kind of really get down. So even stone skin is really, really fun here as well. So have some fun with these. Use those defensive ones if you want to or offensive ones, depending upon the kind of character you need for your party. And into level eight, we'll go ahead and pick a new feat. I'm going to go ahead now and go with um, resilient. So let's stop right here and let's take a look at all the stats of the wild shapes to help you in deciding which resilience to take. I'll provide a link to this down in the description as well, but these are all the wild shape forms. And we're gonna organize this by strength or by dex or by con, whichever one we wanna really focus on and whichever one you wanna play the most with your character. So if you're gonna to wanna to play the uh, owl bear, then we're gonna to wanna to take resilient constitution because this is going to give us one more point of constitution that will put the owl bear's constitution to 18 giving us that plus whatever bonus from that respective ability score remember every two points after level 10 we get plus one to an ability modifier say for example though you want to go with the saber tooth tiger well we would go maybe dexterity instead because dexterity is going to give us more ac for that respective um, shape if it jumps into the next category, right? So the AC right now for the owl bear, nope. For the uh, saber tooth tiger is 13. If we go resilient dex, that's going to make its AC 14. Or for the Dilophosaurus over here, it's going to put their AC up to 15. So take a look at this list and kind of get a feel for what you want to go with with your uh, playthrough of the game. Do you want to focus on the Sabertooth Tiger? Do you want to use the Owl Bear? Do you want to use the Myrmidons and none of this really matters to you? Then you know what? Go this. Let's take a look at the Myrmidons. Uh, Earth Myrmidon has got 17. So one more point of constitution puts it up to 18. Uh, the Fire Myrmidon is going to get up to 16 constitution here. Where's the other one? Air Myrmidon, they're both at 14. You can go with strength on some of them, but most of them are even numbers. The Fire Myrmidon would jump up to 14. And the wolf would jump up to 18. But for the rest, oh, the bear jumps up to 20, which is actually kind of cool. And the love sword. All right, okay, okay. Maybe I didn't make my point so well. But still, you're going to choose the resilience that matches the shape that maybe you want to play the most. I, in this build, I want to go with the saber tooth tiger. I really like the saber tooth tiger. It does a lot of cool things for me, but I'll show off some of the other stuff. So I'm going to go with um, resilient dexterity. And I already kind of built that into the character at the start. But remember too, I could go resilient constitution and still benefit the owl bear as well as the saber tooth tiger. So don't think you're kind of pigeonholed into one or the other. Jumping back into the game to remember that when you choose this, you're going to gain proficiency in that ability saving throws. So having a uh, proficiency in dexterity saving throws, which I actually might already have, I don't, um, is going to be nice. You get, I think, get wisdom as a. Uh, oh no, we started as a sorcerer, so we get our constitution saving throw proficiency. So. That's going to turn that on. It's going to bring our dexterity up to 16 now, which will match our wisdom. And it's going to help us out once we go into wild bear form. Well, wild whatever form, right? So we'll accept this and I'll just choose another one here. Let's do that. This brings us up to level nine, where we get access to more spells. So this is where you would stop if you wanted to go into barbarian, right? Nine Druid, then you'd go three levels into Wild Heart Barbarian, and you'd be able to enrage, and you'd get a bunch of resistance, which is cool. But Insect Plague is so good here. Or you can conjure Elemental and get another Myrmidon that matches the Myrmidon you will eventually evolve into. You can um, plan our binding to uh, uh, bind an, uh, a specific ally that is, well, of the plan arc type, right? Target must be Celestial, Elemental, Fey, or Fiend, and you take control of them, but basically. You can go with a healing here. You can go with Contagion. You can go with Wall Stone. Whatever kind of makes sense for the build you have in mind for your entire party. I'm just going to do this just to have some summons up here. We're going to get one more level into Druid. Uh, well, two more levels, but here's the big thing. Now we have improved Wild Strike. You make two additional attacks after making an unarmed strike with Wild and Wild Shape, and that's huge. That's huge, 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 huge. So now you're going to get far more advantage out of simply being in a shape. And this is the last time that we're going to get any kind of cool subclass features or anything of that sort. Because we now have Dilophosaurus and we have all the Myrmidons that we can evolve into. As a Moon Druid, it's quite fun. We get our final cantrip. We'll just choose one. And we get some more spells. So this is why we go to 10 on the Druid. 
You can stop here too and put another point into Sorcerer or Wizard if you want. You could have done two levels into to Fighter to get Action Surge, but remember you cannot use those abilities if you are in Wild Form. And while I'm jumping up to level 11, is this gives us a level six spell slot because now we get level six spells. So I can go ahead and use Sunbeam and then jump into Wild Form and do it, having done a ton of damage with that. Or I can go ahead and use Hero's Feast which is huge. You and everyone around can't be poisoned, diseased, or frightened. Your HP increases, and you make wisdom saves with advantage. So you just get a lot of really great benefits to jumping into that 11th level of Druid to, to get you some more casting. Remember, you are a wild-shaped Druid. Yeah, sure, cool. But you still are a Druid, and you have a lot of really strong spells at your disposal. And you can use that first turn to cast a spell and then go into wild shape in the same turn. Other druids can't do that. Remember, they've got to do their spell, wait a turn, then go into wild shape if they so wish. That bonus action wild shape is huge. It allows you to turn on your concentrations, use all of your spells, and have a lot of fun. And before we move into a conversation on gear, just to show this off, so what I've done with this character is that I got my druid to level eight. I took three levels into wild heart barbarian, and then I pivoted back into my final ninth level into druid. This gives us are level five spell slots so i can go ahead and have fun here with like conjure elemental or insect plague two very very strong abilities and i get all the capabilities i would have um, of a level nine druid so i have um saber tooth tiger i have pretty saber tooth tiger is that it i feel like i'm talking about a power ranger i have all my really great abilities as a moon druid up to this point but with that being said remember i'm gonna miss out on four well, not four, but level 10 and level 12's worth of HP increases for the wild shapes I want to use. So there is that kind of trade-off that you have to kind of think of when you're taking a look at this. And the nice thing, though, is it's the, the trade-off's still, you know, you get... I went with Wild Heart Bear because in a rage that makes you tough enough to stand up to any punishment, you can use Relenting Ferocity and have resistance to all damage except psychic damage you can't concentrate though or cast so basically if you're doing this you're only really going to be using your character to wild shape and the frustrating thing about that is with this character too you're going to have to come in and out of wild shape to use rage because rage is going to end a after n turn 10 turns or once you're not in combat so i just want to be up front and explain the pitfalls of this type of character. It's still sick because I can go be in enraged bear tavern brawling my way to victory and I get resistance to all damage types, but I'm vastly hindered in the amount of stuff I can do as this character. It's pretty much just wild shapes, just damage, just enrage. It's a really cool thematic kind of thing, but I wanted to kind of show you where this will have some issues because you're going to need to do a lot more short rests to get these wild shape charges online. Um, and we're relying on some items that we've got to help us out with short uh, with uh, wild shape charges, but we'll talk about that in just a second. So this is the wild heart barbarian moon druid version of the build we just talked about. Now, as far as your gear goes, it's super straightforward. Just use everything. It doesn't matter once you jump into wild shape form. There's only four or five like items in the game that really honestly matter. The rest of it is not gonna. So if you're in act one all the way up to act three, act three is when you get those items. Just whatever you find, wear it because you're going to wild shape form anyway. So just have some fun. The ones that are gonna matter though are the shapeshifters hat, which you're gonna get in act three. Increase your wild shape charge by one. This additional charge is restored upon taking a long rest. And the armor of moon basking, which you get right inside of the sewers. Lunar bestial vitality, you gain 22 temp hit points after casting Wild Shape. While those temp hit points are active, reduce all incoming damage by one. So if you get this, you would not be using Armor of Agathis anymore because you can only have temp hit points from one source. You'd wanna focus on one over the other. Armor of Agathis is gonna get you all the way up to the point that you get this in the game though, so it's gonna still serve its use. And it, anyway, it's just part of you being a sorcerer. You're not wasting a spell slot or anything like that. Um, the braces of defense are cool if you're not wearing armor. In this case, we are, but just I had something on. And then the boots of striding are nice because this will give you momentum. While you are concentrating, you can't get knocked prone or be moved against your will. 
these will activate actually in wild shape form. So if you concentrate on something, go into wild shape form, you can't be knocked prone, which is really, really nice. And prone auto automatically ends concentration on something. So I like those quite a bit. They are medium armor though, and I'll, I'll show you why that's a, a big deal in just a second. The Necklace of Elemental Augmentation is nice. When one of your cantrips deals acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage, add your spellcasting modifier to the damage dealt. Um, worth noting here, there is another necklace called the Corvid Token, which will give you uh, feather fall, and you can move, you can fly like five feet further. I'm not using any of the aerial ones, so it wasn't as big of a focus for me, so I, I just don't have it. And it's in it's in the beginning of Act Three from Mattis. Uh, the Shapeshifter's Boon, though, is the only ring or only item you can get in Act Two. You'll be able to talk to the strange ox at the um, uh, last light in the the light light in the the big big light in whatever the hell it's called and that's where you would get this ring while shapeshifting or disguising yourself gain 1d4 bonus to all checks it's basically a free bless and then i've got ring of mental inhibition you when a foe sells a saving when a foe fails a saving throw against one of your spells or actions they gain a mental fatigue for two turns which means they get a minus one to wisdom intelligence and charisma saving throws now as far as your weapons go there is the defender flail which i've heard does give you resistance when you are in um, form, when wild shape form, but I've been unable to test it. That you get an act one in the mountain pass. Again, can't I, I don't have it to test it and I'm way beyond that point. But I would just choose stuff that adds to your spell save DC. And in general, items that save to your add to your spell save DC or spell attack rolls are gonna be huge because you want your spell attack rolls to actually kick off if you're not concentrating on a spell that's gonna um, buff you, if you're concentrating on an offensive spell or you're casting offensive spells before wild shape, you wanna at least make sure those spells actually go off so that action is not wasted. So using uh, uh, staves or shields in that are really gonna be beneficial. And the reason I like staves or staffs, whichever you wanna call it, is going to be because this will have synergy with Shillelagh. This just gives you Vorto 11 bludgeoning damage and uses your spell casting ability for attack rolls. That's not going to be huge in wild shape form, but I might as well get the benefit if I'm outside and someone tries to throw fisticuffs with me. I can at least use this to try and give me a little bit of room. You can even use some of the stuff like arcane battery on something like this. Alleviate the, arc the arcane burden of spell casting the power of the staff. This, the next spell you cast doesn't cost a spell slot. So I can go ahead and use arcane battery, cast a level six spell, and then go into wild shape form. And that's how I want you to kind of think of those abilities as you, you're, you're augmenting what's about to come with your... Um, wild shape so just have fun with wild shape stuff things like boots of uninhibited kushigo which add your wisdom modifier to att unarmed attacks they don't count here or the flawed hell dust gloves which gives one to four necrotic if you're doing unarmed attacks it does not account here same thing here with flesh melters cloak hey if something hits you and it does one to four damage reactive it does not count here um and also, by the way, I'm wearing Cloak of the Weave just to add to my spell save DC and spell attack rolls. So, again, just find those kinds of items in the meantime until you land on the big boys like this one and this one. But for the most part, you're really just kind of having fun with what you got. So putting it all together, how can we really have fun with our spell slots before we even jump into our wild shape form? So let's kind of let's go a little crazy with this. And, and one thing I did want to show off, too, is we're wearing armor right now. And it, the whole point of taking Sorcerer and Draconic Resilience is you're not going to have this armor through the majority of the game, which makes Wild Shape stupid strong. 22 temp hit points, reducing damage by one, and granting two AC to uh, Wild Shape. That's huge, man. That is absolutely huge. So with that off, and for some reason, the game looks at this as uh, armor for the intents and purposes of Bracers of Defense, but not for Draconic Resilience. So we don't have armor on right now. We have Draconic Resilience, which sets our AC to 13. Dexterity gives it a plus three and become the bulwark from those gloves. Now we have 18 AC. Now we have Mage Armor, which gives our, our AC to 13. We can cast this on ourselves. We'll go ahead and do it. We, we don't need to because we already have Draconic Resilience, but I wanted to show you that if you decided not to go with Sorcerer, you can still get that base, AC, uh, <laughs> base AC, which will apply to your Wild Shapes if um, you use Mage Armor. So that, there's, there, there's that cast right there. Now, we also have Armor of Agathis, and I'm going to go ahead and use the Arcane Battery and supercharge this up to level 6. Boom, we got 30 temp hit points. 
and we're going to reactively do 30 cold damage when something hits us. Very cool, right? We have stone skin. Bark skin and stone skin, you can use one or the other. They, you can't use both. Stone skin, though, because it's you're getting this at level uh, four. Turn a creature's flesh in, as hard as stone. It takes only half damage of all non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Go ahead and cast that. It is a concentration ability, so that will lock up our concentration here. So just kind of keep that in mind. And let's go ahead and conjure an elemental. I get, we'll just we'll just go with a, a basic water elemental. Uh, do I want to do that? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I don't know why I would cast that at level four. We'll cast a woodland being at level four. That's that bad boy's up. And we'll cast a level six just to just to show off some stuff here, right? A level six conjure elemental. We'll do an air myrmidon. We could even do a level five one here and do a water elemental. Oh, that's right. It does one or the other. I forgot. I forgot. My bad. But still, my point is we're summoning up a bunch of stuff here because now we're going to jump into wild form. Just to show you what you're going to have active here, let's go ahead and go into Sabertooth Tiger. So, we are now in Sabertooth Tiger. We have two summons up. We can even kind of get spicy here. Some come back. Where are you going, buddy? Now we've got three summons up for all intents and purposes. The wood woe is only going to apply to her. And Halson is benefiting from quite a bit. The Draconic Resilience AC, this character, th this specific Wild Shapes AC is already 12, but we get that plus one from Draconic Resilience. And we get the plus two from Dexterity because we have that Resilience to Dexterity that put our con our Dexterity up to 14, right? It says right there at the very bottom, Shapeshifting 13, one from Resilient Dexterity. We also have a Mage Armor, which won't apply here, obviously. Armor of Agathis, which we're getting. Stone Skin, so now we have resistance to all of these physical damage types, which is lovely. Wild Shape here, Animalistic Vitality, which is part of this Wild Shape. Mark of the Shifter, which is our ring, and Resist to Poison Damage because we're within uh, this aura right there. So we get all this just nice and active and turned on. Um, I didn't even use other things like Resistance to Poison. I didn't use the Feast. I didn't use Aid on this character. All these things that can even further augment being in a shape-shifted form. So just to kind of show you how you can really have a lot of fun before you even jump into a shapeshift to really take a lot of advantage of this character. Let's put it all together and show off some combat. Jumping into combat, let's see what we can do here. We've kind of buffed, we've kind of, we have buffed this character up a little bit. I didn't use Armor of Agathis because I wanted to kind of save that because we have this uh, robe on. So I used a Potion of Haste to give myself an extra action for the, you know, the video we're doing here since we're lining stuff up. And let's go ahead and use... I didn't use Stone Skin either because either, I wanted to show off some of our concentration abilities. So we can go ahead and cast like Plant Growth right here and slow everything down. Or we can go ahead and use Spike Growth here. And now they are slowed and they take damage. Or we can use Insect Play. Locus attack everyone within range, making the area difficult terrain and impose disadvantage on perception checks. We've got a lot of these really good concentration abilities that we can use to our advantage. Even just simply like Wall of Fire to just do a damage in like a, a big old block like that. And then I can attack from outside that wall. Whatever the situation is. I'll go ahead and just use Oak Locust Plague real quick just to kind of show it off. So that's up right now. And we also summoned up a water myrmidon over here so that water myrmidon is on this turn as well cool thing about the water myrmidon that i do like is that it has a healing vapor spell that i can use um it also has a ton of um cold spells that you can take advantage of as well and it has a pretty cool elemental warp and a high mole strike just go ahead and just slash the shit out of someone if you want whatever it is you can use whatever myrmidon you want i just wanted to show you a level six summon that we can have alongside taking advantage of all the other things we can do so we've gone ahead and casted a concentration ability, right? So let's see about anything. That's not a concentration ability, which I don't even know if I took any of those. Doesn't look like I did. That is like any like the well, this is not. Oh, that is, that is, that is, that is. Damn it. Well, of course. And what a great, what a great video this is. Um, 
we and remember too, like rare frost magic missile, it's gonna use your charisma as a spell casting ability. So just be mindful if you took any of your sorcerer abilities, just to make sure you're not using one that you maybe don't want to or whatever it is. You can actually use. Go ahead and use Conjure Woodland being here just to just to exhaust my. Actually, you know what? No, we'll use our primary action to go into a wild shape. And I focus with the Sabertooth Tiger here, and I'll show you why. And with this haste, we still have an action to use. Sabertooth Tiger, I like the jugular strike. Lunge at a creature's throat. If the target is prone, you deal an additional 1 to 16, or 6 to 16 piercing damage. Shred armor, rip into a target's weaknesses, reducing their armor class by 1. Shredded armor, uh, armor class has been reduced by 2. By him. So basically, 1 per turn remaining. Um, you get your Lunar Mend, which is part of you as a Moon Druid, and we have our Bite here. So we have quite a little bit here, and of course, just, just the character itself. Um, we're concentrating, so now we're at momentum. We have momentum up, right? And Lunar Vitality is part of our chess piece. So that is a little bit of a cool thing with this as well. Um, there is an innate regeneration. I don't know if it shows it on here. Well... The ah, animalistic vitality. So affected entity regains two to sixteen HP every round of combat, and that's just part of the saber tooth tiger here. So I'm going to go ahead and use. I know we're going through this. It'll be fine. This is something that's knocked prone. And look at that. We just did sixteen plus that additional sixteen bit of damage there, and we have another attack we can do. I just did another 32, but look, we get even more because of that level 10 ability as a moon druid. So let's just go ahead and shred something on. I'm gonna target myself. That's 75, that's 75, 85. Let that all catch up for a second. There we go, we shredded its armor. And now it has both mental fatigue because of my ability and armor class reduced by two. So this just gives you an idea of what the Moon Druid can really do. How you can really have a lot of fun with this character and use a lot of its really fun abilities. We haven't even shown off how we can use Owlbear to just jump and smash things. So let me jump to that very quickly. So without going through everything, let's just press Wild Shape and we'll go into an Owlbear. And remember, we are a Tavern Brawler. So being a Tavern Brawler, we get to really take advantage of this juicy plus five from the strength here. It's gonna double when we go to hit things. So as this character, we can do a crushing flight, which is really, really, really cool. So I'm gonna go ahead, and we also get our Enrage as an Owlbear. I'm gonna skip ahead to this character's turn again with that crushing flight to show you how you can have a lot of fun. So a big part of that Owlbear, like I said, is crushing flight. I am not enraged, which would actually increase my strength by two, thus helping the damage here. But just to kind of show you here what this does, I can I can click this character. We're gonna deal with an opportunity attack, that's no big deal. There we go. So it doesn't do tons of damage in this very sim, sim, in this very quick instance, but let me just show you. So it did four 1d8 bludgeoning plus one 1d6 bludgeoning, just got terrible rolls, divided by two, plus five strength modifier, Tavern Brawler. So we added that Tavern Brawler strength modifier into this to do even more damage. It would have otherwise done a piddly amount. Same thing here. They unfortunately saved this um, this uh, the uh, saving throw on being knocked over, but they still did a little bit of damage. So you can have fun completely crushing things with your, well, crushing flight. In range makes this do, of course, more damage. Uh, because you've increasing that number from uh, five now up to six because you're increasing your strength by two. But just to kind of show you how this is a really, 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 really fun class. It gets to do a lot of really cool, crazy things. And I think people maybe get a little too um, pigeonholed and just thinking about the wild shape. There's a lot of casting you get to do as this class too. I focus on more of the concentration and having fun in the wild shape, but I really augmented it with all my casting capabilities. And I encourage you to do the same when you try out your wild shape moon druid. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one. Take care. If you have any suggestions on how to change this build, what to do differently, or maybe I didn't really do crushing flight properly with the uh, the owl bear like you like to do it or whatever it is, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Always like to spread as much information as I can. But like I said, have a good one and take care.